Hi folks, welcome to our webinar on chest wall deformities. Uh, today we have a group of our team members here and including Dr. Matt Harding, one of our pediatric surgeons, Dr. Allison Kieser, one of our pediatric anesthesiologists, and myself, Kojin Sao, one of the pediatric surgeons. We are just part of the PECTUS team at Children's Memorial Hermann and UT Health that represents a group of folks that help take care of kids with uh, congenital chest wall deformities, specifically pectus excavatum and pectus carinatum. The reason we wanted to do this was because this is a very complicated process for a lot of folks and we have been taking care of these kids for years and realized that when people come to a clinic to see us, sometimes it's better to have some information up front to get some of the uh, confusing topics out of the way. And so we thought that we would put this together for folks to have to review and to have them better prepared for uh, more in-depth discussions with their doctors when they come see them. So today, um, we're going to talk about our pectus program at our institution. We're going to talk about pectus excavatum, the signs, symptoms, the workup, and the treatments. And we'll touch a little bit about pectus carinatum, also the signs, symptoms, workup, and treatments. And Dr. Kieser is going to talk about the inpatient care and the operative experience and then we'll conclude about some of the post-operative care and the follow-up that uh, goes along with taking care of these children. The first thing you should know is that our program is more than just surgeons operating on kids. This is really a multidisciplinary program that we have in our institution. Not only does it comprise, uh, comprise of the pediatric surgeons, but also our anesthesia colleagues. We have a group of pediatric orthotists that help create custom braces for our pectus carinatum patients, and also pediatric allergy and immunology specialists because some of these kids can get allergies and reactions to the bars, and we'll touch base on that in a little bit. We have a very integrated program that we meet about once a month, and we see all the kids together, uh, and they come up with a treatment plan, regardless of how old they are, uh, from the very small kids, teenagers, and to even sometimes we have adults that are with us. So we're going to talk about pectus excavatum, first of all, and some of you may know this as funnel chest or uh, sunken chest. This is by far the most common of the chest wall deformities. Uh, it is more common in boys than girls. It's about four uh, times as more common in, in boys. There is about one in maybe 1,000 kids that have these. And almost 90% of these kids will have some sort of chest wall deformity that's a pectus excavatum. Now, although we don't know a whole lot about why these things are caused, there is some family history that goes along with this. Some family members, up to 45%, will have these in their family. And as I mentioned, really we don't know exactly what causes these things, although it seems to be fairly common in the patients that we see. But we do know is that these chest wall deformities, including the pectus uh, carinatums, is really a problem with the cartilage that connects the breastbone uh, or the sternum to the ribs. And as the chest continues to grow and develop, usually it's pretty symmetrical and they kind of grow at a pretty even pace. But for some reason, in these kids, the cartilage decided to grow at different paces, maybe the left side's more than the right side. The angles became a little distorted, and so you see chests that go in or go out. And sometimes the ribs are fused when they're not supposed to be fused. And so we don't really know what causes one to go in versus go out. They just decide on their own that at some point they're gonna grow a little bit differently. Now we know that these kids always kind of show up in two groups. One is those that are kind of born with it for some reason, and we see them as infants, and parents get con uh, concerned about those kids coming to see us in clinic. They usually don't cause any problems at all. They're a little disforming uh, when you look at it, but babies are fine and they do great. The other times that we see these kids are probably when they grow through their growth spurt. Their whole life, their chest has been fine. There's been no problems at all. And then one summer, they decide to get really big, get really tall, and all of a sudden their chest starts to sink in a little bit. And that's probably the most of the times that we see these kids come to our clinic to be evaluated. Dr. Sal, when you see this in um, young babies, is this something that progresses as they get older, or does it tend to resolve on its own? That's an excellent question, Dr. Kieser. It just it depends. You know, some will kind of flatten out over time that we've seen, and some will be um, get a little worse. Um, some will be well, will look very significant, but absolutely cause no problems at all. And like I said, we don't have a great understanding of why these things happen and what causes them to progress. So it's a little bit hard to predict, and that's what I tell folks when I see them. We do know that there are some conditions that predispose patients to having these kind of problems, and I'll just mention them briefly. One's called Marfan syndrome, and the other one's called Ehlers-Danlos uh, syndrome. 
And these are connective tissue disorders, and they are genetic, and that is usually a problem with the cartilage. So if patients have this problem, they do have a propensity to develop um, chest wall deformities. These kids usually come in through the office with a series of different types of complaints. Most often it's shortness of breath or some exercise intolerance. Maybe they were running around with their buddies playing soccer and they just can't keep up with them. Or they used to be able to run all day long. And if you're a parent with small kids, you know small kids can run all day long. But they start to develop a lack of uh, endurance. Some will have recurrent infections, pneumonias and whatnot. Some will develop heart problems. But a lot of these kids will develop body image issues. And, uh, and clearly that their chest looks different from other kids. And they become very self-conscious. And you'll have kids that come into the hospital or come into the clinic that aren't very social and don't want to really interact with other people very much. And that, to me, is a very big problem. Would you, you know, tend to agree, Dr. Harding? Yeah, you know, Dr. Sal, I, I think that's a great point. And in fact, when I uh, started to do this procedure, one of the most impactful things to me was to witness um, uh, the changes uh, that happen amongst kids that uh, come in significant problem and they're embarrassed, they don't want to take their, their shirt off. And, uh, you know, Dr. Sal, you're a parent, I'm a parent, and, and you understand how that can really be impactful. And, and we really do see really just an entire change in um, their attitude, the way that they interact and their self-image and, and self-esteem and I think it's one of the most impactful things that, that I've been able to see um, with this treatment. So when we look at these kids obviously not every one of them needs an operation and so it's a very important for us to really get a good gauge on how severe problems are. Kind of break them down into sort of three groups and if they're mild or moderate or they're considered severe and if we think they're kind of mild to moderate, and that can be at any age group, mostly in the younger kids, then we have an exercise program that we'll talk about in which it's helped strengthen their chest and have a little better uh, definition of their chest and help have better chest expansion. And these kids usually follow up with us every six months or so. Now, if we think these kids have a very severe pectus deformity, a pectus uh, excavatum deformity, then we try to work these kids up to find out if there's some underlying problems. And, you know, like kids, sometimes they don't, can't describe all the symptoms that they have. So uh, all these kids will get a cardiac evaluation. They will get PFTs, which stands for pulmonary function tests. And we end up getting a CT scan of their chest to kind of identify all the potential problems with them. And if those kids, after going through all those tests, are in the moderate group, then surgery's not in their future. And they end up going uh, into the exercise program. Now, if they continue to be severe after all these testing, then we start talking to families about potential surgery to correct this as an option. And so when kids that come in, as I mentioned, uh, they get a complete history and physical examination. There's a questionnaire that we have everyone fill out in the clinic, and they're really in sort of layman's terms, you know, are you able to run around with your friends? Do you ever feel your heart racing pretty fast? And there's some questions about, you know, body image and self-image, and I think that gives us a really good picture of how impactful the problem is to these kids. As I mentioned, there's a CT scan, an echocardiogram, uh, an EKG, and pulmonary function test uh, that we do also to uh, measure the physiology behind the problem. And then lastly, there's about probably about five or six percent incidence of having allergies to some of the materials used in the operation. And so all the kids that come in will get some sort of allergy testing to certain metals. And that usually completes uh, sort of the workup. But not every kid, when it comes in, you know, has to go through all those kind of things. So it's really very customized to what the patient's problems are, their age, their situation, and the severity of their problems. The one thing we should probably talk about briefly is something called the Haller Index. And we don't have a lot of great sort of objective measures about how good or bad or moderate or severe a pectus excavatum is. Certainly sometimes when we see it with our eyes, it's very impactful and we can see that this is certainly a problem. But the one thing that we do use is called the Haller Index and basically it's a calculation. It's using the CT scan and what we do is we measure the width of the, the chest and we divide it by how deep it is, this dimension right here. And the deeper you are, the higher number that you'll get and the more severe or worse it'll be. And we use a cutoff, like everybody else does, of a Haller index of greater than 3.25. And if you're greater than that, then you're sort of in the severe category. And that's a very important number for us as we sort of gauge how bad or how good a pectus deformity is. Now, as I mentioned earlier, kids that are in the moderate, mild to moderate category go through exercise program. These are a series of exercises that deal with uh, posture and back strengthening, chest muscle strengthening and then exercise to deal with deep breathing and, and chest expansion. Come back and see us every six months to about a year. 
sometimes these get better, you know, and unfortunately sometimes they continue to develop and get worse. And they may move from a moderate to a severe category uh, during the time that we're following them. You know, Dr. Sow, I think that's a, that's a great point is that as a, as a parent, if you're thinking, gosh, what's in, the, what's in the future here, it's difficult for us to be able to tell. And some kids, it doesn't um, continue to progress. For some kids, it actually gets a little bit better. And for some kids, it gets worse. And so I think it's an important thing to recognize when you're um, deciding, hey, should I be seen or, or what is it? It's very reasonable to come and have an evaluation simply to identify how severe is this and, and, and what should I be thinking um, as, the, as the future progresses. And when one child that, um, that seems to be severe and needs surgery uh, might not be dramatically different, but it's hard to predict over time. And so to be evaluated is very reasonable and, and we can help walk you through that process. Yeah, I think sometimes just come in to get some questions answered. You know, um, we have no problem seeing any patient and we welcome new patients all the time. The severe category, as I mentioned, is a Haller index of greater than 3.25. The pulmonary function tests sometimes demonstrate that there might be restrictive or obstructive breathing patterns. The echocardiogram can show compression of the heart. Sometimes we can pick up murmurs. And then MVP is a mitral valve prolapse. And so sometimes when you compress in the heart, you'll get some leaky valves uh, that we can see on echocardiogram. EKG sometimes will show abnormal um, conduction or electrical patterns. And then the two other categories really um, that would prompt you that maybe have surgery is if the deformities are getting worse, that may be causing other problems. So for example, if the pectus deformity is getting worse and started developing scoliosis, that might be a reason to have surgery. And certainly those that have failed previous repairs that continue to develop problems is, is ones that are in the severe category as well. Symptoms for kids, you know, they're very variable. And so some kids will come with chest pain, exercise intolerance, difficult breathing. And then as Dr. Harding mentioned earlier, the you know, body image issues and the psychosocial issues that go along with this is very important to us. And we want to have a good handle on that too. You know, this impact can really be uh, significant, as I mentioned before. And, and as I said, it's oftentimes the thing that is, as parents um, can, can really be a significant struggle. We recognize that. And, one of the reasons we think it's important to, to, to address these issues and help uh, patients and families work through it. Now, what's the best time for uh, surgery? That's probably one of the most important questions that we can ask. Certainly, you know, if there's problems that needs to be done, that would always be the, the real time or the best time. But sometimes we have some options, and we know that over the years, over having the history of taking care of kids with pectus, that the data shows us that if we do them kind of later on and as they're growing up, the results are certainly better. And so the average time that we kind of like to do, do them is between 10 and 14 years of age. Uh, the average age is about 13. And we do this for a, a few reasons. One is that this is usually the time where they're prepubertal. They're starting to get into that growth spurt. They're just first noticing that, that chest deformity developing. Uh, and their chests are still very soft and sort of moldable at this point. And the reason we want to do this is because, as I mentioned earlier, the problem is not with the bones themselves, it's with the cartilage. And as kids go through puberty, that cartilage turns from very soft and, and moldable to very hard and stiff. And so what we want to do is take advantage of that period of going through puberty to have that chest fixed in place, like having braces on your teeth, to as they go through puberty, they're going to have that cartilage fixed in a position that will maintain their shape of their chest when, the t when it's time to have the, the bar removed. And so for us, the ideal situation is right before kids hit uh, puberty. They show some growth already. Uh, we know that this is a problem that's sort of getting, getting worse. We know that from sort of historic data, if we do these kids when they're really, really small, the chances of it coming back later are higher, and that sometimes they can get a very fixed chest that doesn't grow with the kid as they're getting older. And so those are problems that we've learned over time. And, and certainly there are kids that are way past 14 years of age, and we've had patients that are adults that have wanted to have uh, their pectus deformities fixed. And so that's another age group which we will we'll treat. But as I mentioned, the ideal age group is really the sort of prepubescent group of kids. They recover better. You know, they're certainly better than you and I if we ever went through this operation. And Dr. Keyser will talk about the recovery and how quickly they can get out of the hospital. Now the two operations really for this condition is uh, what we call an open operation called a RABICH procedure, which is very limited now, and it's really reserved for very complicated, very tough cases. 
uh, to do, and that is literally opening the chest to a certain degree and removing all the abnormal cartilages and letting them grow back in a sort of more normal fashion. We rarely do that operation, uh, but although some kids may still benefit from having it. But the majority of kids in this country that have pectus excavatum repairs go through what we call a minimally invasive NUS procedure. And Dr. Harding is going to spend some time kind of going through uh, what that means and, and the implications of having that, that procedure done. Okay, so again, I'm uh, Matt Harding, and I'm one of the, the pediatric surgeons in the group here. And uh, let's take a little bit of time to talk about this operation. This is an operation that, uh, that we do relatively commonly and that has some important nuances uh, that I think it will be helpful to understand. Uh, our physicians here I'm at the University of Texas and at Children's Memorial Hermann worked in conjunction with DRAWMD to create some images that are simple and straightforward for parents to understand as they um, start to learn a little bit about this procedure, so we'll use these. This is an example of a child with a uh, pectus excavatum uh, deformity. So again, Dr. Kieser will spend some time talking about the anesthetic setup and the anesthesia issues and some of the layout just before uh, the operation. But once the child is in the OR, we get them into an appropriate position and they'll be ready for the operation. And before we go there, let's talk a little bit about the bar and what its uh, components are and how it's inserted. It's a mixed alloy the material that's used to create the bar. And this is a picture of it here. It's uh, relatively thin. It's about an inch or, or so in thickness and it starts out straight we curve it to match the curvature uh, of the thorax of the child. Again it's one of the things that's important uh, about understanding allergies although relatively uncommon allergies to these uh, mixed alloys uh, most commonly nickel can create problems obviously with having this foreign material in there for two or three years uh, which is the length of time most children have it. If indeed a child did happen to have an allergy to that uh, a custom bar is made of different materials uh, that were, are less allergenic. So again, in uh, the operating room, once the patient is positioned in, under appropriate anesthesia, we start by creating incisions on each side of the chest very high up into the axilla, just below where the chest is on, on both sides and very lateral. Again, we have the arrows to really give a clear idea, but each of these incisions is about four or five centimeters, sometimes smaller and smaller children. Um, and it goes down and allows access into the right to the ribs where the bar is going to be placed. The next step is we place a special piece of equipment uh, that's known as a port into the, the thorax so that we can actually see the lungs and see inside the chest and watch what we're doing very carefully. Again, this allows us to carefully visualize critical structures to avoid and, and optimize the location of the bar so that we can optimize uh, the reversal of the chest deformity. And this is an actual picture from an operation that gives you an idea of what we see. And this up here is the underside of the chest wall, and you can see that it's in close proximity to the heart. And now, the, the interesting thing is that despite their very close proximity, there's a space that can be created right in between here, and this, of course, is, is where we want to dissect in order to place uh, the bar. Uh, this uh, screen gives you an idea of the pattern uh, that we follow, and again, once we've made the incisions on both sides, will dissect down into the chest in between the heart and the chest wall and then back out on the other side. We initially start by placing uh, a wand across which is shown in this image here and once it's dissected across and comes out the other side we can then take special uh, string and pull it back through and then use that to then appropriately position the bar on both sides. This image down here shows the location of the wand as we dissect in between the caved in portion of the excavatum on the chest and uh, the anterior part or the frontal part of the heart. Uh, and again, I think this is um, one of the things that, again, as a parent and, and would be concerning to any parent, how dangerous is this dissecting so closely to the heart? This is actually a, a safe space and one that, again, as we can visualize it, we can safely maneuver in between these two structures and gain appropriate location and, and safely place this bar. This again gives another image of how that dissection takes place. Let me explain this image to you. The red outlines the heart in each of these images. The light blue outlines where the lungs would be and the lungs are slightly deflated and that's the way that, that we set the procedure up. And then as we dissect with the wand, we dissect in front of the lung and then in front of the heart and behind where the deformity is 
edges and then out through the other side. We then grasp the string, a special string that, uh, that I mentioned before. We pull that back through the chest this way and then we take the bar that we've appropriately measured um, and sized and formed to match the curvature of uh, the child's chest and we place that back through the chest uh, where we can see it on, on both sides. One of the things that's important, and we'll, we'll mention some of the adverse outcomes that can result, but one of the things is displacement of the bar. It's at this point in the operation where we um, take special time to place sutures in order to secure the bar um, into place on both sides, on both sides of the chest, both on the right side and the left side. Uh, this is an image of what the bar would look like at the end of the operation. Now you can't see the bar. All of this is underneath the skin. In fact, the entire bar ends up underneath the skin and the incisions on both sides are closed. But if you could visualize it through, this would be the location and again, that uh, deformity is uh, almost instantaneously dramatically different. Um, Dr. Hardy, could you comment on, you know, if the patient was feeling their chest, where could they physically feel the bar? Yeah, it's a great question and a great point uh, uh, that we deal with. Um, the, the three places I think that people most commonly feel uh, this operation postoperatively are right here in the middle of the chest because um, I think a, a good comparison is that of braces. When you, when you have braces placed and it moves the teeth in certain ways, they feel a soreness there. The same thing is true with the chest. It's a bone, that, that then bone and cartilage that's being moved and that movement creates a soreness right in this area. The other two places that you feel it are, are on the outside portions or lateral portions of the chest near the um, armpit or axilla area where we've made the incisions. This is where the bar is secured to the chest and also where the incision is, is closed. And again, Dr. is going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, the pain control uh, that we provide and, and the ways in which we try to minimize uh, that postoperative pain. But for the kids, they can actually feel the metal material mostly on the sides. Absolutely. And then they yeah. can't feel anything in the middle of their chest. The middle of the chest is a normal sort of skin and bone and everything. So. That's right. We don't make any incisions here in the middle. And so as uh, Dr. Sal is pointing out, uh, this is the place where they can uh, most commonly feel it. They just feel a soreness um, sort of throughout their chest with the movement and restructuring of the bone and, and the cartilage. So what are some of the potential problems that, uh, that can result after surgery? Um, it turns out that most children tolerate the surgical procedure well, and, and actually most of these complications are rare, but it's important to understand what the potential problems are. Some of the early problems that can result are a pneumothorax, which is um, air that's in between the lung and the chest wall. Occasionally, that requires the placement of an additional small tube in order to evacuate uh, that air. Most of the time, it resolves on its own, though, and we would follow that with some special x-rays in order to visualize the lungs continuing to expand into their essentially normal space. You can also get fluid uh, that's inside the chest uh, for a variety of reasons. And again, most of the time this resolves on its own, but occasionally requires the placement of a small tube. Pericarditis is inflammation of the of the heart and of the surrounding structures to the heart. This occasionally results, again, is relatively rare and usually resolves without significant intervention. We can provide some medications and, and very rarely any of these could require uh, removal of the bar, but again, most of the time they resolve without um, such significant measures. Some of the problems that result don't present early after surgery are allergies to the bar or even an infection um, that, that can happen over weeks or, or even uh, months. Some of the signs that these are happening are increased redness and, and irritation, both at the site or generalized, and, and then um, redness or leakage around the incisions can signify an infection. And that would result in a workup and um, usually um, small procedures or uh, medications such as antibiotics to try to minimize or, or stave off that infection. As I mentioned earlier, both of these can result in the need to remove the bar, uh, particularly if they had a bar allergy, and then either placement of a, an alternative, a bar that's made of an alternative metal or some other solution. This is an example of uh, a child that 
was managed in, by our surgeons and in our clinic. And again, you see the classic pectus excavatum uh, deformity. And three years after repair, this is an example of, of their chest. This particular operation also required a small incision in the middle of the chest, which we use sometimes to lift up the chest with very severe deformities and to help the dissection that's in between the heart and the chest wall posteriorly. But I think this is a good example of, uh, of the change that can be seen with this type of repair. So we're gonna switch gears at this point and talk about the other chest wall uh, abnormality that we see. It's uh, commonly known as a pigeon chest. It's, it's a pectus carinatum. And this, as opposed to a, a concave or a caved in chest, is an out, uh, outward uh, sticking or outward protrusion uh, of the chest. It's a deformity that's uh, less frequent uh, than a pectus excavatum, however, can cause many of the same issues. Sometimes it's symmetric and, and sometimes it's asymmetric, and so sometimes it's a bump that's off to the right or to the left side of the chest, and sometimes it's right in the middle. The indications for surgery are a little bit different than you would uh, see for an excavatum. Uh, in that one of the most common complaints uh, that uh, patients have is pain. Um, it causes them pain, they feel pain, and along with that there can be irritation either because it's rubbing against their clothing or, or for whatever reason is, is just kind of constantly creating an uncomfortable feeling at that part of their chest. I think you also have the same self-image or self-esteem concerns that can arise uh, with children as, as with the other uh, deformity. And so again, I think these are reasons to have any sort of uh, abnormality of the chest assessed in our clinic. There's a variety of interventions uh, which can be deployed uh, to treat pectus carinatum, and it turns out the most common initial intervention uh, in this country is bracing or orthotic bracing, and you can see a picture of that here. Over time, these braces uh, have really improved, uh, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, where once they were very bulky, they're now much easier to conceal um, and, are, and are much more comfortable and, and compliance, meaning patient compliance has improved dramatically. I mean, it turned out that kids uh, used to have a difficult time with these braces, and now they're much easier to, to, to tolerate and to manage. Um, and, and so we've seen a lot of success. And in fact, this can end up resolving the issue uh, in a significant portion of patients. Again, it depends on the deformity, but there's a really high rate of success that exceeds 50% uh, with this and oftentimes without any surgery or any other intervention. When bracing doesn't work or is not appropriate for a patient, there are smaller procedures, either something called an osteotomy, which is an incision in the bone to sort of reorient its, its shape, or a perichondrial resection, which is taking out part of the cartilage and leaving the the outside so that there can be a reforming um, of a particular area or small focused area. These are small procedures that require incisions on, only as large as necessary to access the area that's protruding. Uh, a third and, and larger uh, operation uh, that Dr. Sal mentioned as a, a possibility for even pectus excavatum is called a ravage type procedure. And again, this is a procedure where you can um, actually separate the breastbone from the ribs and either change its orientation or change its uh, shape. Again, relatively rare, uh, but sometimes necessary with more severe carinatum deformities. Okay, so we're now gonna switch to the third part of the talk, and Dr. Kieser is gonna talk a little bit about the anesthetic issues and what to expect, both before, after the surgery, and with regards to pain control. Hi, my name is Allison Kieser, and I'm one of the pediatric anesthesiologists here, like Dr. Harding said. So I'm gonna talk about basically what happens once the decision has made for to, to proceed with surgery. So what the whole surgical and operative experience is like. Once the decision to proceed with surgery has been made, you will be sent to our clinic, to our anesthesia clinic, where you will meet a pediatric anesthesiologist who will perform a, a complete history and physical examination and also review any lab work or studies that has been done <coughs> and perhaps request any additional studies that may need to be done prior to surgery. During that time, we'll also discuss the operative process, including what to expect the day of surgery, during the surgery, and following surgery as, you're, as the patient is recovering. And of course, we'll answer and welcome any of your, you or your, children, your child's questions. So while we're meeting your child and performing our history and physical, we may ask some questions similar to what Dr. Sow has already mentioned, but basically to assess the heart function and the lung function of your child to, to make sure that um, we have all the safe, safety measures in place before proceeding with surgery. So some of those questions may include, does your child play with other kids, does, or does he tire quickly, does he or she become short of breath easily while, while exercising, 
Has your child ever fainted? Or has your child ever complained of a rapid or funny heartbeat? And this may prompt us to um, acquire additional studies prior to proceeding with surgery. One of the most common questions that we receive from parents is, is my child going to hurt? And that's a, that's a very good question. It has been shown that the degree of pain that patients feel after surgery is directly related to the degree of pectus severity, and it can severely affect the child's perception of the whole surgical process. To manage the pain, we, we assume a multimodal approach where we give non-narcotic medications, narcotic medications, as well as epidural anesthetics. And that this is why the preoperative visit is very important because it allows us to tailor the specific plan for pain control to your patient. Because every patient is different and may require a different way to treat their pain. Dr. Kieser, can you give some examples of non-narcotics or narcotics or other anesthetics that maybe parents might have heard of or that they might see on the internet? Sure, of course. Um, non-narcotics could be NSAIDs, something like Motrin or ibuprofen. Tylenol, and then narcotics would be like an opiate, like a um, hydrocodone. Um, another name would be uh, Zolvit or Norco. Um, and then the epidural lo local anesthetics, those are similar to what you receive when you go to a dentist's office. They basically, they are numbing medications, like lidocaine. So why do we do multi multimodal pain control? Well, there are various different types of pain receptors that are in the body, and so we we plan to treat the pain by, by treating as many of these receptors as possible. One of these receptors would be the, nar the opiate or narcotic receptor. However, these medications sometimes can cause desirable side effects like nausea, constipation, or itching. So we'll, we may include other medications like the non-narcotics and then the epidural local anesthetics have been shown to, to provide very good pain relief. Um, for most patients after the, these, especially these pectus surgeries. So what to know? Um, it's very normal for you or your child to be anxious about surgery. It's important as a parent to talk to them and answer any questions they may have and have an open discussion with them. Common concerns for patients would be pain. Is this going to alter my body in a negative way? Um, and then there may be a fear of needles as well. Adolescents or the, the age group that we see for pectus usually they're able to discuss their concerns openly, but they may be, do, may be reluctant to do so in a physician's office. So it's important to, to have this conversation before going to meet your surgeon or your anesthesiologist. The day before surgery, a preoperative nurse will call you and um, she'll go over some of the logistics for surgery. So she'll go over um, how long to fast before surgery. This is very important. We will give strict instructions on when the child should stop eating and stop drinking. And this is because when we give anesthesia to kids and they go to sleep, it can relax all of their, their muscles in their airway and it can cause them to regurgitate or vomit up whatever is in their stomach and it could go possibly go into their lungs. So we strictly adhere to the, these fasting rules and ask that you do so just to maintain the safety of your child. And we'll go also go, the nurse will also talk to you about what medications to continue the day of surgery or to stop. And then she'll go over things like where is pedi pediatric day surgery located, what time you should get there, and where you should park. The day of surgery, you will meet your friendly pediatric anesthesiologist. They'll come meet you in the in the day surgery op preoperative room, and they'll go over your child's history, review any studies that were done, and then again go over the operative process and um, any questions that you may have. So each anesthetic that we provide to patients depends completely on the patients themselves. Some are able to tolerate uh, having an IV placed before going to surgery, and then others would prefer to have a mask, anesthesia gas, once in the operating room to go to sleep. So younger patients usually prefer the inhalational induction, which is the mask, and before that we can give some medication to help ease their transition into the operating room to help relieve anxiety. And then the IV induction is most commonly given to older patients who prefer not to go to sleep with the mask on their face. For the epidural, it's a small catheter or tubing that's placed in the back and it sits outside of where the spinal cord is and it allows us to give numbing medication for pain control. It's similar to what pregnant mothers receive when they're, when they're about to deliver their child. There are some risks associated with the epidural placement. These include uh, sometimes kids can have a headache, back soreness in the area of where the catheter enters the skin. Bleeding and infection is also possible as it is any time we go in the skin, but it's very, very rare and spinal cord or nerve injury is also very, very rare. And we place these all the time for these types of surgeries because we feel that the risks of epidural placement are actually outweighed by the benefits that they provide for the, for the pain control.
And the decision to place an epidural is, is a joint decision between you and your anesthesiologist. It, we don't place it for every patient, so it's a conversation that you will have prior, prior to going to surgery to decide if this would be the best way to treat your, your child's pain. Following surgery, once surgery is done, the child will wake up in the oper or start to wake up in the operating room and then go to the recovery area. And parents are often invited to come and be with them as, as, your, as the children wake up. And basically, they're there to be monitored to make sure that the pain is well controlled prior to going to their room. To manage your child's pain after surgery, we have a special team here, the Pediatric Anesthesia Acute Pain Service, who are available around the clock to help with pain control. So that may mean adding additional medications, coming down on dosing, changing the epidural, that sort of thing. In postoperative day one, we really encourage your child to be out of bed and to, to practice exercises to prevent um, lung infections, deep breathing exercises. And then post-op day two, we expect that um, hopefully your child will be walking. Should your child have an epidural in place, as your child starts to recover and feel better from surgery and starts to eat normal food, the epidural is usually transitioned to oral medications. Additional medications may also be, be added at this time, including stool softeners or laxatives, because of the constipation that is commonly seen with narcotics. So Dr. Kieser, depending upon patient and family, I know that there are other options out there um, in addition to either an epidural or to oral pain medications. Can you talk about some of these less commonly used but sometimes nuanced uh, opportunities for pain control for patients? Sure. One of these, these options would be doing a, what's called a, a nerve block, and that would be injecting um, numbing medication at different areas in the chest wall, and this would be done after surgery. That would only last for about six hours or so after surgery, so it's a temporary way to, to control pain, but it, it does work. Another way would be what's called an on-cue pump or a, a ball that holds a numbing medication that is placed by the surgeon at the incision site, and that also delivers numbing medication continuously for pain control after surgery. On average, patients usually stay in our hospital about five days. However, this can vary from patient to patient. We like to create a treatment plan for your patient, specifically to your patients, and they're usually dis discharged home on an NSAID like ibuprofen, perhaps Tylenol, sometimes a narcotic or an opiate like Zolvit or hydrocodone, and sometimes a med medication for muscle spasms. Uh, and it's not uncommon for pa uh, patients to receive these medications for uh, up to four weeks after surgery. So this is a, this is a big surgery. This is a major sur surgery for, for patients. And we do everything we can to make this as smooth as possible for both the patient and their families. The anesthesia team is always here to help. We're always around to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Dr. Kieser for providing a great overview about how patients are uh, taken care of in our hospital. When the patients are ready to go home, uh, they'll have a follow-up with the surgeon in about two weeks, and they'll be given very specific instructions on what to do. There'll be some limitations with activities. Uh, certainly, you'll go home with some medications, and then most kids will have some directions about how to bathe and take care of the kids as they transition. In our experience, uh, kids do great, and they certainly do a lot better than how adults would do with this kind of stuff. They uh, will bounce back in a couple of weeks, and in about six weeks, they'll be sort of back to normal, and uh, usually about six months, they feel like they've never even had an operation, uh, is what folks uh, tell us when we see them back. But as you go home, it's important to remember that the surgeons and the anesthesiologists are always available for questions, uh, and that we'll be in constant contact until you are able to come back and see us uh, in the office. So um, as we finish up today, we just wanted to thank everybody for participating and hopefully you've learned a few things about uh, chest wall deformities and pectus, uh, excavatum, and carinatum care. I'm wondering if any of my colleagues have any final comments or uh, for the folks out there learning about pectus care in our institution. Yeah, Dr. Sal, I, th I think one of the things that might be helpful to, to talk to families about and make sure that they understand is um, how often do we see patients like this? How, how common is this in general? We touched on that, but I think a little bit also about our clinic and that we take care of a number of these patients. We feel very comfortable with it and, and certainly welcome a wide range of, of different patients. Maybe you can touch on that. Uh, I think that's true. You know, I think we have built a program around uh, all different types of uh, patients, those that need operations and those that don't need operations. 
And so when we have the integrated sort of multidisciplinary team, um, it's to take care of not just the ones that we need to, oper that need to operate on, uh, but those that don't. And so actually the vast majority of our patients are those that we're continuing to follow up through the years uh, to make sure that their pectus deformities don't get worse or are causing problems. And, you know, I, I think, Dr. Sal, the final thing for us to talk about is if, you know, if you're a parent, how do you get in touch with us? I think the first thing is just a call and uh, make an appointment. We're happy to see anybody uh, at any time. And uh, they can call our um, Pectus Clinic at uh, UT Health and Children's Memorial Herman Hospital. That number is 832-325-7234. And that clinic for us is located uh, in the Texas Medical Center. Uh, we're in the University of Texas Professional Building. That address is 6410 Bannon St Street. Uh, that's Suite 950. It's also known as the Pediatric Surgery Clinic. And so uh, we see patients every day of the week there, and we see Pectus Clinic about once a month. So on behalf of Dr. Kieser, Harding, and myself, we'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to hear us talk about Pectus and chest wall deformities. We hope it's been an educational process for you. And if there are any additional questions or comments, please do not hesitate to contact us.